What's up, everybody? I am the Uncanny Omar, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing two wonderful folks that have been working in the comics industry for many years. Up here is Mr. Silvestri, Mark Silvestri. How's hey. it going, sir? How's everybody doing? How you doing, Omar? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you for being here. And over here is Matt Hawkins, who I've had the pleasure of talking to in, in the past before about some projects he worked on and then some upcoming projects. Uh, but both of these gentlemen now at Top Cow. And I, I did ask uh, Matt how that came about and how you two got together. And Matt, how long have you been there again at Top Cow? And what is your role again? Uh, I'm the chief operating officer, the president, and an editor, writer. Um, I, I think it's been 20, 23, 24 years. Um, oh started God. in oh, April of 98. And uh, 25 years will be 2020, April of 2023. Wow. So a little while. Does yeah. it seem like it's been that long? Never. Uh, no, you know what's yeah. weird? I, I, yeah, I, I, the first six years I worked with Liefeld in my head seems like a lot longer than the uh, 25 years I've worked with Mark. <laughs> I don't know why. Early image. It was crazy days. Yeah. yeah. And Mark, what is, what is your role now at Top Cow? What is, what is it exactly that you do? I'm the CEO and then I just uh, kind of hang around and let uh, everyone else do the work and I just take credit for it. Mm -hmm. That's what see. That's what CEOs do, right? So, no, um, uh, my my role is just, um, you know, I, I work with Matt and, and everyone, and uh, uh, I I try to do as much creative stuff as possible, you know. And Matt does as well, and you know, he'll attest to this. It's it's difficult when you when you have when you're multi hyphenated, yeah. and you have a company to run, and you have things to deal with, you have publishing to do. You know, we can talk about other stuff too, but you know, we have our hands in other media all the time. Like literally, you know, uh, every day we have to deal with where things are in that department, not only where things are in publishing and just new ideas and creating stuff. So that there, there's always a lot going on, and um, you know, I, and probably the same thing for Matt too. And you know, um, Matt, you can chime in with that. But the most favorite part uh, of all of this is just creating stuff. I mean, that's, there's where the, that's where the fun is, you know, so you just kind of, you put the other stuff aside, you know, that's, that's business. You got to do it, you know, but, uh, creating stuff, um, that's what we do. And it's what, that's where I spent, I, I like to spend the most of my time. My day is split in two parts. Uh, daytime is business brain. Um, and that's when everyone else is awake and I can do my emails and phone calls and, uh, nighttime is when I do creative stuff. It's when I draw, it's when I write, <clears throat> um, just finished a um, big Batman project that's been in the, in the works for quite a while, you know, decades, yeah. <laughs> you know, it seems like. Um, and that's coming out in November. Um, yeah, very excited yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I literally work till four o'clock in the morning, you know, um, crawling yeah, I, I, around five. No, I, I echo that. I, I actually write in the morning when I can, and I do try to do email and business in the, in the afternoon. Um, so it's kind of an overlap. I actually try to sleep at night. I'm like, Mark, Mark gets no sleep. Yeah. No, I, I do remember sleep. we're just opposite literally i'm going to bed yeah. right when you're waking up yeah i get up around you get an email from me usually about five six in the morning i'm up i'm starting to write i write usually till 10 or 11 then i grab something to eat and then i come back and and dig into whatever uh, actual like business work needs to be done i know uh, yeah when i got to talk to uh, matt earlier this year or maybe it been late, late last year but yeah we talked about like the actual process of writing and then like when you wake up to do it and how often you do it so it's interesting to hear your your approach at drawing and okay so i've already told you this behind this before we even started this you are my favorite artist of all time all time <laughs> i'm serious dude. Yeah, i appreciate it. thank I, you very much i i have been following your work um oh my gosh so so many decades and seeing you branch out and you know become image comics and then still rocking it with Top Cow just brings me a lot of joy. Uh, you were the guy that, you know, Uncanny X-Men, Wolverine, when I was reading those titles uh, at that you know, age. What were you, like two? <laughs> no, no, no. I was, I was were you like an embryo? High, what the hell high, you high, school, high school? I was on the way to high school when Wolverine was coming out. You were killing it, man. Yeah, killing You're it, way, dude. dude. Well, however old you are, you look great. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's yeah. the, it's the lighting. the lighting. Is that your filter? The lighting. You got some filter going on. Yeah, it's the filters. I'm using some uh, Instagram filters. Yeah. Like I even know what that is. Um, but yeah, followed your work, and then you went over to Image, and you guys knocked it out. And yeah, crazy. You got, 
you had some great titles. You had, you know, Cyber Force, and you had Darkness, uh, Witchblade, of course. And that propelled a lot of different creators, too. Like, yeah. you put a lot of creators out there, and they are still working to this day because of everything that you did and a lot of the people over there at Image. So, so I have to ask, when you're talking about writing, and, like, how much different was that or how what was that level of stress going from penciling, you know, your own thing yeah. or, or penciling other people's uh, work, right? To, okay, a lot is riding on this. I'm going to be plotting this. What, what what was that transition like for you? It was um, surprisingly uh, more time consuming than I thought it would be. I, I, I can't say it was more difficult, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, because, like I said earlier, I mean, you know, Matt and I, we aside from all the other stuff, we, we live to be creative, right? So, it's, so we, we get energy from that. It can be draining. You know, uh, anyone out there who's listening who is a creative person or is in the business, I mean, they know that. I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend that it's not hard work because it's absolutely some of the hardest work that you'll do. You know, I got into the business thinking it was going to be a breeze. You just sit at home and draw pictures and somebody sends you a paycheck. Woo <laughs> dream job. Uh, yeah, you know, Matt's shaking his head because he knows it's not like that at all. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's like I've been in this business, like you said, you know, it's like uh, going on now. Geez, now it's like 40 some years, 41, 42 years wow. uh, since I've been in the business. And, um, you know, over the decades and, uh, you know, and I've had a lot of um, fortune uh, in my life where, you know, I got to work with Chris Claremont on the X-Men in the 80s. You know, I was like, I, that, I, that is a moment you, you can't trade for anything. I mean, who can say that? Not many people, right? Um, and then I got to work with Larry Hama on Wolverine in, in the early 90s. And then, of course, you know, Image just blew up like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then we all got to do whatever the hell we wanted, which was, uh, you know, double-edged sword. <laughs> it's yeah. all, the, all the stories <laughs> attest to. But, you know, as time goes on, you know, as, a, as an artist, you know, uh, you, you kind of go... You reach a certain age and you're kind of feeling you know i gotta i gotta reinvent myself some way right and i've always kind of dabbled in writing you know i, I but i wrote for other people uh, mm -hmm. there's, i don't have a lot of pages under my belt as a writer um but i enjoyed it right it was a part of the creative process that is vastly different than drawing um so when i did this batman project um and i went you know i'm just going to do everything except for the coloring and the lettering right i'm going to write it uh, and Matt's been really helpful with that. Um, and I'm going to draw and pencil it. I'm going to ink it, uh, the whole thing, you know, it's going to be originally six issues and I was writing along and just realized, damn, this is a, this story I need to tell in a certain way. And, you know, you, you always want to stick the landing. And I kept going and I'm driving Matt nuts and I'm like, Hey, you know what, let's call DC. I need, I need to go seven issues with this, which, you know, I was already taking years to do this project. So man, and, like, and double sized. Don't forget the part that you made it double sized. Yeah. Because as I was writing the seventh issue, right. To, to stick this landing. Cause it's this, you know, I, I like the story. Um, but again, you need to stick the landing, whether it's, you know, comics or TV or movies or not, whatever. It's all about how you finish things up. I'm writing the seventh issue. And, you know, I'm going, I'm halfway through that. And I go, I can't fit this. Right. <laughs> so it's like, man, we got to call DC and it's 10 more pages. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they said, sure, whatever. They were happy to, to oblige, you know. Um, and she yeah, so it's seven and a half issues, really. Um, but the the thing is, is like as a, as an artist in comics, you know, depending on who you're working with, um, the writer, you know, your, your teammate, your collaborator, um, you always are going to come across um, stories that have these massive things where you've got a bazillion heroes over here fighting a bazillion villains over there. Uh, they got to do this. They got to save the world from blowing up. Oh, that's, you know, that's page three. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah. what do you, I promise myself I, I would not do that when I uh, wrote and drew my own thing. So it's like mm -hmm. I, I tried to cater to my strengths and cater to things that I wanted to draw. At the same time, telling a story I thought would be really entertaining, um, and I did still find myself writing things because you're in that space, Matt. You know, you, you get in that space. It's, it, you have to service the characters and you have to service the story. And sometimes to do that, you know, you have to write things that, as an artist, I would hate to draw. 
right? It's like, so <laughs> once I finished writing it, you know, I kind of had to go back and draw it. And I'm sitting there doing my layouts. I'm drawing the pages. And I was like, God damn it, who's this a hole that wrote this thing? <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, that was me. But oddly enough, um, uh, some of the, uh, the pages that uh, were the ones I was least looking forward to that were kind of out of my comfort zone and maybe not the big stuff that people uh, are going to see a lot of in this series and I'm known for, you know, uh, those are some of my favorite pages. You know, they're just like these smaller, and those, there'll be a panel that I will go, that's one of my favorite panels in the entire seven issues that anyone else will go, what the hell are you talking about? You know, right. where's Batman? <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? But to me, I get it. Right? So it's, it was a real eye opener. Your your version of Gotham City, I think, is is going to hit uh, hit people over the head in a, in a good way. I, I was looking at some of those pages again, and uh, some of some of the detail and, and just the scope of it uh, is unbelievable. Oh, cool! Thank you. So, you know, I, I treated um, I treated Gotham like another character. Oh, that and that's the proper so, way to deal with something yeah. like as big as Gotham. Uh, before we go any further, though, I do want to give a big thank you to Lisa for helping putting all this together and Absolutely. she's in, she's you, in the Lisa. chat right now trying to answer some questions as, as best she can yeah. um so you're okay I, I this is just fresh on my mind because I, yes i am a huge fan of x-men and um uh wolverine but i realized for the first time i'm reading these old conan stories and i've noticed your oh. artwork in there dude and and the first thing i noticed was they they credit you as mark Silvestri with a k yeah. In the old comics, right? Of course, it's all fixed when it's in the new um, omnibus editions. I got used to that. Did, did you, I assume that happened quite a lot, right? That was before an email could be sent out. Hey, it's actually with a C. Can you please yeah. regret? Um, but the the style that you were drawing with, of course, you know you've you've shaped it over the years. But man, that was so reminiscent of Big John Buscema. Oh yeah, he was my my major influence in comics. That's what my I was first gonna influence. Ask. Yeah. When okay. when people come to me at conventions and show me portfolios and such like that, and, and Matt, mm -hmm. you probably like even kind of throw that out there too. Like my uh, my initial influence is Big John, right? Big John Buscema. That's that's where the fundamentals lie, and then you kind of go off from there and do your own thing, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of people, and myself included, kind of looked at other comic book artists for inspiration and and learning and how to draw this, how to draw that, and it's a it's a slippery slope. Because just because you're a fan of somebody's work doesn't mean that you should draw like that person, right? Mm -hmm. Because there should there could be some fundamental flaws in there that become bad habits that you never get away from. So for me, like like John Buscema, it was all about the fundamentals, right? Because mm -hmm. if you look at his work, depending on who worked over him, ink wise, you oh, had yeah. some really elaborate um, inking done. You know, Alfredo Alcala and all that stuff and. Uh, all the way down to like, you know, pretty standard superhero stuff. And it was great because no matter how elaborate it got with the line work uh, or simple it got with the line work, the fundamentals of John Buscema was always there. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where I kind of launched myself. You know, if I can get those fundamentals, like nobody can draw someone just sitting in a chair like John Buscema, right? right, to this day. Right. And he wasn't like, you know, crazy with reference. You know, he just knew how to do it, you know, but because he he learned and he studied the right things. He's classically trained, whatnot. But you know those fundamentals, and then hey, throw all this the fancy stuff on top of that. You know, mm -hmm. hey, I like the way this guy renders stuff. You know, I like the way this guy renders stuff. Ooh, look at those little ciphers that that person uses. You know, I was like, that's pretty cool. You know, Art Adams, that's pretty cool. Jim Lee, that's pretty cool. You know, it's like Bernie writes, and that's really cool. And you, you throw that on top of the fundamentals that you've learned, right? Yeah. So I all think the one of the fancy things stuff works. Some of the things I don't think you, I've never heard you talk about your work that I actually was listening to Rob Liefeld's podcast for the first time the other day and he was talking about you. And he, he, it was interesting because he was talking about how you're a master at doing panel layouts to move your eye around the page. And uh, I've never actually heard you really talk about that. But yeah. when he said that, I went and looked at Batman and I was like, yeah, it kind of flows. And, uh, and one thing I've, this wasn't something he said, but I've always appreciated the angles you do that you don't just do a straight static shot uh, on like so many artists I see, they just, you're just looking straight on, like you're looking at us like this and uh, moving the camera around. So you get different angles, up angles, down angles. Uh, one of my favorite panels in, in Batman is when he's jumping off the roof, you know, in that first issue. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a small shot, but uh, it's just, it's, it's perfect because it's, it's exactly what you would expect to see. 
And uh, I, I just that to me separates the uh, the true you know true artist from uh, the others. <laughs> well, and, no, and, and thanks. And this is what you know. And Matt, you were you've been there, and it's like when we had the you know working studio um, where you know you you alluded to this earlier, Omar, about like uh, working with young artists and such, mm -hmm. um, and teaching what I could teach, you know, and developing their natural talents, and they were all naturally talented. Um, one of the first things I would tell them was like, look, uh, yeah, it's fun to draw big shots of this, big shots of that, pin up things there, but well, that's not your job. You know, your job is to tell a story. That's your job, right? And comics is very unique in that it's a, a very specific medium, right? It's not a novel where you're reading words and your brain fills in all the gaps visually. Mm -hmm. It's not a film or a TV show yeah. where you're getting the visual information and it's very passive, right? And you're being told exactly what's going on, you know, auditory and, and visual, you know? Um, and it's uh, it's a hybrid there, you know, comics is a static medium, right? And it's giving you weird information because it's giving you words and pictures, but it's not giving you motion, right? So you, your job as a storyteller is to trick people's brains into thinking that these static images are moving, right? And they're being paced at a certain level. And part of that is how you do your layouts and how and what you focus on that's important on that page because that image is going to leave the indelible impression. And that image is going to help tell that story and, and give an emotional reaction. It could be small, it could be big, right? But you have to pick that. And like Matt said, it's about the flow across the page, you know, and you usually... The traditional manner is an S pattern, you know, um, this way if I'm going, yeah, because I'm reversing the image here. So, you know, you, you follow that way. We, you know, we lead, lead left to right, you know, and you kind of go down there and uh, you want to make sure that you never put anything in there. And I'm guilty of this. I, I have made my mistakes, but you don't want to put anything in there that stops the reader for a second, right? Because then you've lost the pacing and you've lost your reader because then they forget they're just reading a comic book. Yeah, and, and and feeling a story, and they go, "Oh wait, that uh, doesn't make any sense to me." And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm go ahead. But no, I said that's kind of like a fourth wall break in TV or film when you see it, like what stops you and makes you realize, "Oh, I'm watching a movie," you know, or yeah. I'm, I'm doing this. And uh, I see that. I, I tell you, every time I come back to the comic store with a stack, there's half of them where I'm like, I always stop at the center because they do something in there that makes me think that it's a comic. And I think that really is uh, is the key is to moving your eye effortlessly around the page. And, uh, you know, like I said, after I was listening to that, I, I went back and looked at Batman specifically. And I, I, there's just little things you do, like where you jog the panels to where the panel is just a little off to where it's really clear where you go. And sometimes uh, with lettering, they try to fix that on certain people. But you don't necessarily have that, which is a six panel grid. And uh, I, that's I, I don't know. It, it's, it's actually something new I learned about your work with Batman by looking at it from that point of view. And I hadn't looked at it that way. Um, you know, I, Omar, I remember talking about this last time. It's, I've always felt like writers get too much credit uh, in this business. You know, I, I feel like uh, the artists, especially now, uh, it's a visual medium, you know, and uh, writers seem to get a lot of credit for a lot of artists that don't. But uh, without the art, it's just it's just it's not a comic. You know, I mean, it's a prose novel. And uh, I, I I wish I, I wanted to swing back the other way. I, I think we need to. And I think we are doing that now. You see that a little bit more amongst the top tier people. But uh yeah, the art the art is pivotal. It's key. It's a it's a team. You know, it's a team effort. You know, and that's why when you have a really good team, magic happens, right? And it's like um, that's where the classic stuff occurs. And you know, it, that's one of the beauties of this medium, right? Is it absolutely? I've always said that. Yeah, it's literally that combination there. And you know, it's like I wanted to give a shot of, of doing the whole thing. You know, doing writing and drawings. It was a lot of fun. You know, it was a big headache and it was a big project. It was a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I look back at it and go, you know, it, it was a good mix for me, you know. Um, but yeah, definitely it's uh, it's a medium that that is very, very unique. And, uh, you know, some people get it much more than others. And, you know, those are the ones that everyone is drawn to. You know, uh, for various reasons, you're just drawn to it. And if people are drawn to it, then that that team, that artist, that writer, the creators, they've done their job, right? right? Regardless of the style, mm -hmm. right? If the audience is captivated, right? 
they did their job. Yeah. I I think the book that really changed my world uh, when it comes to reading comics was uh, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Because I never really, like, I had favorite artists, right, growing up, like most kids did. I'm like, oh, I'm going to follow this artist. I'm going to follow that artist. But understanding the medium, like like you were explaining, you sound like a college professor. Actually, both of you do, uh, talking about, like, this stuff. Um, Man, I actually it, went to college. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a long time. <laughs> didn't, didn't do me much good. <laughs> one, so one semester for me. <laughs> uh, that's good though. That's good. They got you in there. But it, it's the only place you can do certain things, right? Movies can do movies. Um, books, you know, prose novels like are a lot different than comics. Comic books are just one thing, and it can only there's only so many things that you can do in. TV shows and movies and comics can you just get away with a lot more. It's, well, it's, no, it's a special collaboration. And one of the things I, I would, a recent example is I watched the Sandman show and I really liked it, but then mm -hmm. I went back and read the books it was based on. And I'm like, man, these books are just better. You know, I mean, the, I'm not denigrating the show at all. I thought the show was amazing, but uh, I, I then reading the comic book after I'm like, Oh, they left this out. I understand. And part of me is I go back and I uh, try to, break it down and, and deconstruct it and figure out, oh, why did they not include this? What did they do? Just just for fun, you know, and uh, for educational purposes. But uh, no, comics is a truly unique medium and it's a collaboration between writers and artists and, and colorists and letterers and everyone form, forms a, a crucial point. I mean, one of the things I, I, I really like Troy Petrie, who does most of our lettering and he does a really amazing job on uh, different books. And uh, yeah, the, the, he's, he's lettering Mark's Batman book, too, and uh, I'm really, really happy with the way that came out. Yeah. And it's a whole skill set as well. And, and to kind of uh, put a little a point on what we're talking about, um, I tell people this all the time in that, um, you know, because over the years, you know, Top Cow, you know, uh, we've dipped our toe in all media, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've done movies, we've done TV shows, we've done video games. Um, uh, all that stuff, right? And I always tell people that uh, are creative or they want to get into the comic book uh, industry or, or whatnot, and I, and I say, look, we've we've experienced uh, varying degrees of success and involvement in all these categories. And the I, I can say this because you know I, I have experience, and Matt, you do too, that the best, most unfiltered, easiest, cleanest way to get your creative voice out there is a comic book because it doesn't cost millions and millions of dollars to make. You don't have to answer to any other executives at studios. You don't have to deal with <laughs> any of that stuff. If you have an idea, you know, if you're an independent guy, person that just wants to make a comic book, you can actually do that today. You can take a couple of your paychecks, view your paychecks, whatever it is, you invest that in yourself. And in a few months, you have a comic book in your hands that you created, you wrote, or you drew, or you did both, whatever it is, there you go. And we still feel that way. You know, if we have ideas, you know, we can put it out there relatively quickly and no one can tell us no. <laughs> right. So comics is great that way. You know, and hey, if the other stuff happens, that's awesome. That's great. But it starts with making a comic book and just enjoying that process, you know, enjoying what the end result of that comic is. I think, you know, one of the things I always talk about is for, for better or for worse, the comics that we put out are exactly the way we want them, you know, and uh, and so you don't have that luxury in film and television and other media because you have so many other people that come in and change things, you know. So, um, you know, I, I think we talked about this last time, Omar, but I worked on the Power Rangers and a few things and, and I, mm -hmm. I, I just not interested in that anymore because uh, I, I like working in comics because I get to collaborate with guys like Mark and we sit in a room or sit on Zoom and chat about cool stuff and Mm -hmm. go back and write outlines and and then suddenly six months later there's a comic book that looks cool you know and i think that is actually my favorite part of the business is uh, is the two ends of it. i love making the story like mark said like the outline phase is probably my favorite part but uh, my second favorite part is actually getting the finished book i love that because then it's like you feel the sense of accomplishment and pride um some of the stuff like uh like mark actually is really good at scripting better than than i i thought you know, no offense to you, but you're way better at scripter than I thought you'd be. And uh, I, <laughs> no, I, I thought, thought you were gonna yeah, suck, dude. A lot of artists are uh, a lot of artists are not good scripters, and they get a lot of other people to even ones that write their own work. They'll get someone else to come in and do the dialogue. And uh, scripting is really hard. It's also for me 
And I don't know if you feel this way, Mark, but actually the dialogue scripting part is my least favorite part. I, I actually, if, it feels like a job. Like I'm sitting down. It's, it's the work. Page yeah, it's one, the panel work. one. What's yeah. the guy saying? You know, and yeah. it's, it's the equivalent to doing a layout in art, which happens very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, it just it's just flowing out of you. It's like because I work when I do my layouts, I work pretty small. You know, I have four pages of layout for every like eight and a half by eleven sheet of uh, copy paper, right? And there's four pages on there, and you just you zap through that stuff, and there's no there's nothing to bog you down. And you know, Matt, the plotting part of it, and the idea part of writing, that's what that is. Yeah. Right? So scripting is like when I have to actually draw those layouts on the big paper. Right. right? It's it start it slows you down. It's like that's when you start to second guess yourself. You yes. know, um, and Matt, you've been invaluable to me uh, as a story editor. Thanks, man. The stuff that I know, absolutely, because and all your notes are like spot on, right? And this is a thing that people have to understand. And one of the things when you know we had the top cow, the working school, I always told people, look, uh, you you need to develop a thick skin like right now, right? And you need to be open to suggestion, you know, criticism. Is a tough word, right? And that's I, I I didn't use that very often, you know. But I always used you know suggestion. Right. And you could always tell the people that were going to get better and go places by how open they were, right? And there was a few, you know, because there's been a lot through the doors of Top Cow, and there's been a few that just went, I know exactly what I'm doing, you know. Right. I mean, what the hell are you here for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? well, why are you here? Why am I why am I spending energy on you? If you already know what the hell you're doing, if you're already a professional level guy, right? And uh, I don't even know where they are anymore, you know, but all yeah. the ones that were open, right, um, to suggestion, um, they they learned and they yeah. wanted to learn and they wanted to get better, you know? And so when, when Matt gives me notes, and I, you know, I, I always make sure to tell him this because, you know, it's like, dude, you're not going to offend me. You know, it, it makes it better, right? And, I, and vice versa. You know, it's like Matt will throw something on my, on my side. Say, what do you think? And I'll give him my thoughts. And at the end of the day, it's always better. Yeah. And that's, I, I think editorial is an interesting thing because uh, finding an editor, like it's hard to find an editor you trust to work with that you actually are going to accept there. Because Mark's better at taking my suggestions than I am at taking anyone else's. I have to say that because when I get editorial feedback from other people, I, I it does irritate me at times. And uh, <laughs> I, I have to sometimes stop and just, and I always tell people that give me notes on my stuff, I said, send it to me and let's talk tomorrow. Because my knee jerk is always going to be kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I just get angry and I, it, it's just a reflexive thing. So I always tell people, sit on it, you know, and self editing, if you don't have access to an editor, I, I am a firm believer. If you're going to write something, stick it in the drawer, pull it out a week later and then read it again. Yeah. You know, and then, and then, because you read it with a pair of fresh eyes um, and, and give it another look and, being open-minded is, is, is important, I think, in this business. And drafts are your friend. They yeah. can be tedious, but never think your first shot is the one that's going to get made into right. a comic or whatever the hell it is. Because you, you do have to refine. And like Matt said, you know, you put it away. You know, part of my process of putting it away is I give you know, it to Matt. You know, so, and I wait a little bit for the you know, response or in the, you know, in the case, you know, DC, you know, Ben over at... Uh, at you know the Batman office, you know, wait for his notes and stuff. So I, I get a little while uh, to let it sit outside of my consciousness, and I see it. And like Matt said, you know, fresh eyes. And even if you don't take that specific note, because maybe your brain works a little bit differently, that note could trigger the better thing, right? It's like, oh, okay, uh, I didn't think of that, but I'll word it this way. You know, I mean, it, and that happens a lot. You know, because it's still your own voice, even though you're getting the notes, um, you still have to reinterpret again. It's like, okay, this is, but this, this is my voice. Um, I mean, I've lifted some dialogue directly from your notes, and I've also tweaked it. Yeah, uh, and it's like, okay, well, this is this is the way I would say this idea. You know, right. so, and it just works. You know, I, 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 like you know, Matt said, you, you keep the open mind. Yeah, and you keep the ego in check. The ego that creative people have a real problem with egos. Yeah, right. their own in, individual ego, myself included. You know, it's look all of us image guys when we started. You know, bunch of punk asses with big egos. You know, we that's why we almost ate each other alive and blew up the whole thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we survived, and um, uh, 
one of the things, you know, whether it's experience or, or getting older or whatnot, you kind of realize that, you know, your ego can be your own worst enemy. You know, you know I, I was listening to Chris Rock on somebody's podcast and uh, he, he made a comment that I thought about and stuck in my head. He said, I have a big ego, but low self-esteem. And he said, when you have that combination, it creates a unique situation. And I thought about that for a long time. And I'm like, God, that's most artists I know. <laughs> you yeah, know, it, well, I think low self-esteem. I think you know? they're doing the same thing. You know, yeah. People that have high self-esteem don't have a visible, a visible ego. You, know, you don't need it. You know, the ego is the ego is a construct of the individual. Right. right. It's like so it's like we all suffer from that. You know, it's all it's all based on insecurity of what we're doing. You know, um, there's I don't know. Jeez, I would I would assume that even the most successful people out there, uh, regardless of medium, have that terror <laughs> of insecurity. Of, well, are people going to like this? You know, or that is going to suck. You know, the directors are famous when their movies coming out. I guarantee you, they're not sleeping at night. You know, it's like I think oh, if you look at be received. If you look at any successful creative person, I think they will tell you that they have an, an inner circle of people that they trust to give feedback to them. And uh, you know, I, everyone I've talked to in film, TV, comics, they all have one or two people. And uh, you know, finding those people is, is pivotal. I, I cannot stress how important editors are. Uh, you know, Brian Hill. Uh, used to edit my work, and uh, I, I became an infinitely better writer because of that. And then for a while, I was sending a lot of my stuff over to Stefan Sedgwick because he just writes in a different way. And uh, I and he would give me thoughts and notes back, and some of them I would agree, and some of them I would disagree. But uh, I would encourage creators and writers and artists to share your work with your friends and family, and 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 take take their feedback uh, for what it is. You know, sometimes uh, one thing I tell writers a lot is uh, have them read it. If they're and have them tell you what happened, and then if they miss certain things, ask them if they they just forgot that for the moment or if they don't remember that. Because if they don't remember that, then you need to go back and address that and figure out how to make that land better. You know, so Mark's Mark's comment about the landing, I think, is, is ab absolutely important. You know, and uh, so you know, and I, I one of the things I try to do as an editor is I try to ask questions instead of making statements. You know, like if I go to someone and say, hey, have you thought about doing this? Or, or what about this? Or what was your intent here? Or what's the tone? You know, you shifted mood here. Is that intentional? Because sometimes people do things and they don't even realize it. Yeah, and, and that happens too. When Matt sends me a note, um, it's worded that way. And it's like, I'll go, oh, shit. Okay, uh, exactly what Matt's point was. It's like, oh, I, obviously... And it's not his fault. He was reading it, right? right. So it's my fault because I didn't I didn't convey the message properly, you know. And that's important, right? So you know, and again, it's it's about the end result, you know, because that's what everyone's going to in comics. That's what everyone's is going to hold in their hands, right? Is the end result. They don't care how it got there. Right. They just want to be entertained by it, and that's that's really our job, you know. Uh, is once we put it out there, we become invisible, and it's like it's then it's theirs to enjoy. You know, it's like, and if we did our jobs right, they enjoy it. If we didn't, well, that's that's on us. Yeah. You know, so. Right. But yeah, we've been around forever. You know, it's sometimes it's hard to believe that Image is celebrating thirty years. You know, um, it, it's it's mind boggling to me. You know, um, and Cyberforce, thirty years old, is mind boggling to me. You know, so I'm happy to talk about that stuff. You know, what do you want to know about those days? How. Okay, so somebody was asking a little bit earlier when when you were doing cyber and, and I've asked uh, I've interviewed Todd McFarlane and uh, Eric Larson. I asked them the same thing. For you, was there a backup plan, like, or are you like, I'm gonna ride this out, <laughs> or were you like, eh, I'm gonna not burn any bridges and just make sure everything is fine first? <laughs> well, it, you know, it, when the image happened, right, and you know, when I had that. Famous meeting with Todd in the lobby of the hotel, you know, mm -hmm. on, on Marvel's dime because they flew me out to New York for uh, an X Men conference. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, I talked to Todd in the lobby. You know, he pulled me inside. Yeah, but you've got this thing going on that we we talking about, and you know, we want to. What do you think? And gave me like the pitch, and was like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Todd, and he'll keep going. You know? yep. um, so I, I think the conversation was probably forty five minutes. You know, I was already in after minute two. Right. It's like, right. Oh, yeah, of course, because, you know, un unbeknownst to anyone, unbeknownst to Todd, especially, it's like I was I was kind of done in comics. 
you know, I'd done the X-Men with Chris Claremont. I did Wolverine. I was mm-hmm. like, yeah. where else am I going to go? You know, it's like, so I, I was literally looking for a new way, a, a new career, maybe in film. You know, it's like, I got nowhere else to go in comics that, that would be interesting to me. And then boom, right there, image happens. And it's like, okay, here we go. Um, but it, it's interesting because when everything blew up, right. And, you know, um, it was all image, image, image. Oh my God. It's like, and it was crazy. And, you know, Matt will attest to this and you will attest to this because you were, you know, fan looking at all this stuff. It was as nutty on the inside, if not more so than as it was on the outside. Um, and, you know, years later, people say, oh, you know, it's like, or ask, wow, the risk, you know, what were you guys ever afraid? And I, I have to say, we were never actually afraid, right? Um, fear was never something that was even mentioned or in the forefront because we were so busy trying to make stuff happen and just the excitement of it and the adrenaline, right? Um, like for me personally, you know, uh, Jim Lee and Wills Portacio and Scott Williams had Homage Studios in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And I was living in Los Angeles uh, when, you know, Image hit. So I was like, hey, what's up, you guys? You know, I was talking to Jim Lee, and it's like, he said, why don't you come on down and join Homage? It's like, wow, all right, okay, I'll do that. You know, so I went down and joined Homage. So it's like the beginning of Image. It was like like one huge, massive studio, like some of the like, like most awesome people in comics in this one yeah. condensed space. Um, but the risks um, was was kind of in the back, right? It's like we all took the risk, right? Financially, we all went put our own money in. People, I think, I don't think realize this, but you know, the people who started their own business realize it that when you do start your own business, you're paying for everything, right? So it's coming out of your pocket. That's part of the risk. But you're cutting checks and all that stuff and going, well, okay, wow, there goes. Wow. Well, okay. There's another few zeros off, you know, my savings from, you know, my <laughs> X-Men royalties, <laughs> you know, it's like, but you got to write those checks, um, which we did. We were happy to do that. Uh, once, right. once we realized that this was going to work, you know, when we first saw those young blood numbers, we went, this is going to work. We're going to be fine. Right. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, everything was still crazy and all that, but you know, I always tell people now in retrospect, it's like, look at the end of the day, you know, if it didn't work, really, is Marvel going to tell Todd McFarlane, no, we don't want you to come back to draw Spider-Man? Right. Uh, of course not. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, we were kind of always wondering, scratching our heads. And, you know, man, I don't know if this was going on at, at Extreme, but it's like why we were getting kind of some pushback from a lot of other creators, right? And why they weren't willing to take the chance, especially once Image was shown, that it's, it's working. Yeah, I mean, it's it's up to you. you. You you can make it work, you know. And it's like I kept thinking in the back of my mind that you know people that took over the books that we left, you know, thinking that they were you know on Easy Street. And I'm going, wow, guys, you know, if Image fails, you're all back to you're all you're off those books, <laughs> you know, because Jim Lee's flying right back to the X Men. You know, yeah. it's like, and Todd's going right back to Spider-Man and whatever. It's like, you know, and Rob's going right back to X-Force. You know, it's like, uh, no, they'll take us back in a heartbeat. So the biggest risk, I think, was, you know, af- after it was like, okay, you spent some money, it didn't work. But I think embarrassment would have been the biggest one, really. And disappointment, you know, because the I, potential was there. I have to say, I mean, it was... Uh, I... It was before the internet, right? So I know it's hard to think about that, right? Yeah. You had no idea how many fans would follow your work outside of X-Men, right? Like maybe in your head, you're like, oh, they like X-Men. Obviously, yeah. that's why they're buying Wolverine now because I used to draw X-Men and I'm on Wolverine. They're buying the same thing. Yeah. Because now, you know, it's a little bit easier. It's a little like, I, and I, I think, yeah, I mean that. It's a little bit easier for a writer or an artist to know exactly how many people enjoy their work because, you know, you have a fan following on social media or people coming to you at cons and everybody's just so interconnected. But back then it was like, I'm going to take a chance and do my own story. And if people come great, that would be awesome. And man, it kicked ass and people came. And well, I think if you look pre image, there are a lot of examples of uh, artists like top tier artists and writers that were working at Marvel and DC that tried to go off and do a creator own project. And uh, they would get 10 to 15 to 25% of the sales of it. I read an article on comic speed a year ago where they were talking about something like that. 
And, uh, you know, these guys were able to bring the fans along. I think the way they did it, and I, I wasn't there for the very beginning, but I was there April, May, 93 on, is mm -hmm. that uh, they all left together. You know, you, you had the six biggest artists at, at Marvel Comics. They all left together. And, uh, and I, I Marvel, you know what? Go ahead, Mark. That was Sorry. the key. That was the difference. No, go ahead. That was the key. And, uh, you know, I mean, Marvel looked and said, I, I remember reading something in some report somewhere, I think it was a Marvel report, they talked about, you know, we have 300 artists, six left, who cares? Yeah, it's kind of the summation of what they were saying in some sort of quarterly report or something like that. And uh, was it Tom DeFalco? Was he the editor-in-chief back then? It was Bob yeah. Harris, right? Or, Bob Harris, no, was, Bob no, Harris he, was the X-Men artist. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But Tom DeFalco was the guy, yeah. Because I remember Liefeld used to get into it with the Falco sometimes, and uh, it was interesting to uh, watch and, and, and listen to. Um, and because Rob would sometimes get on the phone, and he would put it on speaker, and, and he would talk, and we'd just be sitting there. It'd be me, Eric Stevenson, you know, Dan Frega, and a couple of people. We'd all be there listening, and it was quite uh, it was quite entertaining at times. I, I do know that uh, you know John Byrne is an example of a guy that Rob went after to write Supreme, and he basically said, you know, fuck off. That's he told them no. Flat yeah. out said no, and and yeah. I, I guarantee you, John, I lost huge money because of that. Yeah, it was uh, it was wow. interesting to us that we got turned down so many times by writers, and we were. I mean, I'm not just talking about doing work for uh, for Image. I'm uh -huh. talking about literally inviting them to be a partner, right? Right, to be one of the original Image partners, right? And we got turned down left and right. And I think, really? You don't want to take at least a little chance? You know, you're this guy, you know, insert name here. Mm -hmm. right. you know? And it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's like, no one's not going to hire you again, right? You've got job security. If this doesn't work, you just go back, right? They're not going to, you sold comic books for these companies. They're not going to say no to you, right? Yeah. So it was really, it was kind of astonishing, right? And, um, and again, this was before social media, like like you mentioned, um, and I, I would imagine like today, social media, you know, people would have gone to that and really kind of gone against us, right? You know, we would have oh, had, right. you know, a lot of hating, you know, social media. You know, we were kind of insulated from that because mm -hmm. all the news and all the hype was all excitement, right? And right. that excitement, you know, translated directly to positivity, right? Because you didn't... You didn't have, you know, you couldn't go down the rabbit hole of looking at comments, right? That didn't exist. Right. right. All you got was like this positive press of some of a revolution happening, right? So, uh, it I, I think that kind of helped us in a way. Not only just the fact that the fans did follow us like crazy, you know, and and everyone knows also that the speculator market, you know, uh, drove a lot of what was going on, yes. uh, and we all knew that was happening too. Um, uh, but you know, uh, those things guarantee that we were going to have at least a certain amount of survival, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and obviously, you know, we've made changes, you know, uh, because we had to. And one thing that Image never did, we never sat on our laurels, we never sat back and waited for something to happen, right? From the very get go, when Image even started. The attitude is we're not waiting for anybody, you know, right. sink or swim mistakes, no mistakes. It doesn't matter. We're, it was all forward motion, right? That's all constantly, even when we screwed up and even when we were at each other's throats, it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, we had some legendary meetings where <laughs> if we weren't just nerds, you know, we would beat the crap out of each other. You know? <laughs> but, you know, and, and, but at the end of the day, at the end of the, at, at, it doesn't matter what words were thrown at each other. At the end of the day, it was a big group hug. You know, we're all brothers. We're all fighting the same fight, right? Mm -hmm. Let's move forward. You know, screw the man, screw the sca status quo. This is what we're going to do. And it, that drove us all the way. Uh, and it still does today in the sense that, you know, we are not going to wait for trends to happen. You know, we're going to, we're, we're, you know, image, everyone knows that image um, has transformed oh, yeah. into this, you know, really like massive uh, uh, creator haven where people can come in and publish their books and get their ideas out there. Uh, and that's, you know, 
speaking of Tom DeFalco, you know, 30 years ago, I was getting a call from him every couple of weeks saying, Hey, when are you coming back? <laughs> you know, you know, your little, your, your little fun and game is going to be over in six months. Once you come on back, you know, and I, I love yeah. Tom, you know, we, we had a great relationship, but I was just laughing. So he would laugh. And, uh, that was 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. I don't recall Rob getting those calls, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a little more contentious. I he burned his bridge a little more than you did, you know? Yeah. No, I, I, I didn't burn any bridges, actually. And it's, yeah. It wasn't my style. You know, I, I was doing my own thing. And it's like I was hyper-focused on that, you know, because I was still friends with Bob Harris. You know, I, I actually really liked the guy. You know, uh, I actually felt bad for him because he was in a terrible situation. You know, and, and so was Tom, that they had to somehow – spin it internally and publicly that us leaving like matt mentioned us leaving was not a big deal yeah and it wasn't going to affect uh marvel one way or the other well you know we all know how that went you know so. and it was it was nothing but comic like comic book store rumors an article would pop up here and there you get an image of spawn and you know, again before the internet right guys mm -hmm. so there wasn't a, there wasn't a twitter feed where like mark yeah. Or so much was Wolverine, right? It was just we we heard yeah. about it after you had already walked away, right? And you yeah. were already working on Cyberforce. It was only fanzines, fanzines, and, yes. and you know, and then Wizard Wizard magazine hit, and yeah. you know, we we kind of helped put Wizard on the map, really, because it was all image news, yeah. you know, that um, that helped them to put an anchor into the, uh, you know, into the into the sphere that they were the go-to place for any kind of comic book news. You know, they became hardcore influencers back in the day. Yeah. You know? um, but that was well, pretty much it. Well, one quick question, Mark. I, and memory serves, weren't you, didn't you finish your story arc? Like, didn't you do a couple extra issues of Wolverine or something while, yeah. after Image started? And yeah. I don't think anyone else did that. I still, have four, more did that. I still have four issues to go. <laughs> and, I, and I told Bob, so look, dude, you know, um, and I gave him the news, look, I'm leaving for Image. You know, he's, he understood. He was cool about it. I said, but, you know, look, um, I, I, I'm I not going to leave you high and dry. Uh, I'm not going to leave my, my writing partner, Larry Hama, high and dry. I will, I'll do these four last issues for you. Um, gives you time to find somebody else. And then uh, let them out. Yeah, so. <laughs> I didn't then, know that. That's yeah. awesome. Like, that's yeah. a class act move. That, that's 50, Wolverine 54, 55, 56, 57. Yeah. That's your that was one of the reasons why my Cyberforce book was like, oh my God, I got I to gotta get this book done. My, you know, I'm I'm next in the queue, right? right. So it's like it was like this real panic to get the book out, and it was you know consequently late. But you know, I, I had a commitment, and I wanted to keep. I knew that you were my favorite out. artist for that reason, man. I didn't even know that story. So I'm glad yeah. Matt brought it up. That's awesome. Uh, very, <laughs> very, very cool. Um, because it so wasn't their fault. You know, it wasn't you know. Uh, it wasn't the fault of people I worked with at all. And I didn't want to leave them, you know, uh, without a paddle, you know, and just yeah. say, I'm out of here. You know, it's like, um, I, I, that's just the way that I kind of operate. So, um, and then, you, then, you, you, know, definitely, you definitely didn't burn any just cause you, you, and you have done work for Marvel and now you're sure. doing things for DC and from time to time you do that. And I think that's great. Like still putting, your name out there in these, you know, two big companies while still doing your own thing. Uh, you just released the Cyber Force 30th let's anniversary. Talk about that. Yeah, let's 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 talk about that because this is the home of collected editions, obviously. So I do have to talk about collected editions. Okay, it's a nice wall, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Well, half of your stuff is up there, man. Like yeah, that's where all my X Men omnis are with your beautiful nice. artwork. <laughs> so years ago, about I want to say ten years ago. I was getting the um, the compendiums, the big, thick, soft cover books. There was two for Witchblade, I think two for Darkness, and then Cyberforce got solicited one. And I got excited. It was on Amazon. And I, matter of fact, I think it was on Amazon up until like two years ago. It just got taken off. Like, this was 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a Cyberforce collection coming. Um, there was going to be a hardcover, maybe a soft cover, But then it just kind of went away. And I... Um, I was like, I wonder if we're ever going to get anything. Because outside of like a trade paperback here and there, there wasn't a complete collection of that era. So along comes the Kickstarter. And holy crap. Yeah. And you see, that's, the, I mean, the Kickstarter route really shows you the love for these books. I mean, you guys did uh, Witchblade mm -hmm. and you did Darkness. So you know there is a huge interest in these type of books. So why, just out of curiosity, why didn't you start with uh, Cyberforce first? Why, why, why did you guys decide to go with 
Darkness and Witchblade. Well, I, I can explain that as simply as uh, when we solicited it, because I actually remember when we solicited the one from 10 years earlier. Um, and then we went in to look at the files on the DAT drives. We, we saved everything on these things called DAT drives and ISDNs because they were back from the 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we queued all these things up and two thirds of the files were corrupt. And uh, I mean, we gone. were <laughs> gone. I mean, there were hundreds of issues, including Witchblade, Darkness, and there was hundreds of issues from like 92 to 98 that were just gone. And so we've systematically over the last 10 years recreated all those files. Okay, so they had to be touched up and... Um... I mean, a lot of people don't realize how much it goes into making these, right? Because you these books were coming out at the time before digital comics were being published they have to be scanned uh they also have to be touched up some yeah and i mean there's a lot of work that goes into this vince longo uh who is our you know our production guy that handles all this stuff i mean he had to go in there and basically remaster yeah all the pages you know, recolor get, them. yeah recolor them get them where you could find them and just kind of just, uh, quite frankly you know people who you know get this compendium and matt it's available in stores yeah. yet or it's it's available. Of, I, i'm yeah. not sure yeah it's out in stores now yeah you, you can get this like and you know, you've seen it omar it's a it's a brick of a book it's uh 660 pages something like that something like that yeah 660 pages of like pure 90s goodness right <laughs> that's um, right you know it's pure right. 90s bombast it's all there you know the colors the the, the double pagers we even have the we did the crossover with Wildcats back in the day, and and Jim, because we were all trying to one up each other, had this quadruple gatefold. Oh my gosh! Remember I know that those yeah. are in the books. Yeah. It's, in there. Yeah. In it's in the compendium. You can yeah. unfold and go. Oh my god! Nineties. Look at this. <laughs> you know, it's like, and to yeah, Mark's Mark credit, there. he insisted on doing those foldouts, even though initially I was opposed to it because the yeah. cost in printing those was insane. Yeah. So we so actually we had uh, to do it. Yeah. yeah. If we're going to do the '90s, you got to do the '90s, right? So it was, and it was a lot of fun um, to see all that stuff again. To be honest with you, and mm -hmm. uh, it actually looks better now, I think, than it did back uh, then. You know, the, it, it is a truly. It's like going from DVD to Blu-ray. Yeah. Right. Um, yep. And, I, agree, you know, I agree with that. Yeah, and that's because of, of the work that, that Vince put in there. It's months and months of, of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it was great to see these stories again and kind of. Kind of for everyone who's watching this, you know, and like you, Omar, who was there at the beginning, you know, it's a great way to kind of reminisce about the bigness um, of what we were like. Everything was big uh, back in the '90s because it was again going all the way back to the early part of our conversation. You know, we we all knew that you know because comics was a static medium. You know, you have to make things leap off the page to the reader. You know, and it's like. We were very cognizant of that. So you're, you you page through these stories, and it's like you can't help but kind of get a smile on your face, right? You know, and it's like, wow, this was this stuff was a lot of fun. So I think it's great for people that are familiar with it mm -hmm. to go back and go, wow, I remember this. Oh, I remember the, how this made me feel. This was like fun, fun, fun. Yeah. And for new people, it's all right there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in this big ass co collection that you could literally kill somebody with. You know, it's it ways that it's beautiful and big, and it's it's there. The first like twenty five issues, is it Matt or something like yeah. that? Yeah, the uh, I believe it's the first twenty five issues. Most yeah. of those uh, compendiums are are twenty five issues. And in fact, uh, you know, I've been reading some of the questions popping up in the comments, and the big guy Tanner O'Neill there is asking about Weapon Zero, and we are doing that. And Weapon Zero, Cyber Force, all of Cyber Force, all of Witchblade, all of Darkness, all of those will be included uh, as hardcovers and, and compendiums. And just to explain the, the oh, and route. thank you, Tanner, for uh, backing our Kickstarters. We appreciate Thanks, that. Man. Yeah. Appreciate that. And to everyone, thank you. And I've seen some of the comments. Uh, there was one guy who commented that uh, he actually uh, got his package from UPS of the Kickstarter, of the Cyberforce Kickstarter during this broadcast, and he was unboxing it. So that's kind of interesting. Huh? <laughs> we'll, have, uh, we'll have Mark read it to you. Mark that's can read it for 10 pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, I think it, I think, first of all, I, I got to say something, um, because doing interviews with a lot of creators, most of them don't seem to go back and look at the stuff, right? They're like, oh yeah, we have this book out there. It's collecting my work from to, uh, 1995 to 1997. It's good stuff. Yeah, I remember. But just the pure look, like the enjoyment on your face when you're talking about this era, man, that's awesome. It's like. 
I think you have to have a hand in this because you were there at the beginning when you 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 were there drawing these stories, so you remember what it was like. Yeah. So I think it's very important for you to oversee these projects. Like, okay, that's that's your baby. You might as well see what the end product looks like, uh, right? And I think that's really cool. It's a, it says a lot about your character again. Like, not a lot, not a lot of cre a lot of creators like it's good. Buy it. Well, it's and that's that's why there was that ten year delay because it took us that long <laughs> to get something that Mark would approve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I'm that's not scary. kidding. I mean, because we initially started doing it and there was weird moray patterns on things and yeah. it just didn't look good and. It it took that long, and, and Mark's right. We should give a special shout out to Vince Longo because he he sort of cracked the code and figured out how to do it. Yeah. And, and I agree, him, they actually look better. Yeah, him and Elena, you know, yeah, uh, Elena. Yeah. It's like they just put their heart and soul into this uh, book and uh, into the uh, Kickstarters. You know, it's, it's just amazing. It's a lot of work. It really is. And um, you know, we appreciate everyone who um, was part of the campaigns. Absolutely, you guys. Without this, you know. Uh, Obviously, we couldn't make it happen. So uh, we really do appreciate it. And, you know, you, you, when you do something like this, it becomes you know, this love fest of, of a community, right? And everyone gets to be part of it. You know, if you contribute to it, wow, you're suddenly part of this cyber force thing, right? You, you've become part of this family. Is like, a lot of people came up to me because I've been doing conventions again. Uh, they go, oh, yeah, I was... A, I got the Kickstarter of Darkness, or I got the Kickstarter of Witchblade, and I got the you know the Kickstarter of Cyberforce. Like, and, you know, I thank them, and it's like, and I tell them, you know, it's the truth. It's like, you know, without you, we couldn't do what we do, right? So it's this partnership, right? We we have the, our own little uh, economy, right? You, you buy what we do, we can make more of what we do, and you can buy it, right? So it's like we truly are teamwork, team members, right? It's like we we. We need each other, right? And we're also all, all of us, uh, no matter what side of the, um, the table you're on, um, we all do this because we, we love to be entertained and we love to entertain um, and we do it through the medium of comic books, right? And for years and years and years, it was our own little secret, right? And you go to conventions and there's like nobody else outside of those conventions or your, your close friends or whatever knew a damn thing about comic books, right? Now, now everybody does, right? And, uh, you know, uh, look, I, I say more, more to the party, you know, uh, you're welcome to be here, you know, and uh, I'm just happy that we all can still do what we can do, you know, so I appreciate uh, everyone and uh, all your support. It's been amazing. Awesome. Do we want to answer some of these questions? I see a ton of them, actually. Oh, my God. I don't see them. Am I, am I I, oh, should I be on the comments? Uh, you click on comments now that the bots are gone. But on live, uh, like uh, the Terry Glitch question, uh, I can answer that and say, yes, uh, we will be reprinting those books uh, when we do the next volumes. So <laughs> Witchblade Volume 1, Volume 2. When we do Witchblade Volume 3 Kickstarter, which will be the next one after. And one of our... Uh, uh, one of our goals with the Kickstarter is we do not launch a new one until we finish the fulfillment for the last one. And uh, we, we crossed over once, but we're never going to do that again. So once Cyberforce is completely fulfilled, we'll then set up for Witchblade Volume 3. Then after that one is done and fulfilled, we'll do Darkness Volume 3. And then we're going to do Cyberforce Volume 2. There might be some other ones in there, but uh, those three will be uh, the next three Kickstarters that come out over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So we'll all be okay. like, awesome like this one. You guys are doing one Kickstarter at a time, so they don't overlap with each other. Is that right. what you to clarify? Okay. Uh, so good news about the reprints, because I've had several people email me and message me about the Darkness, especially Volume 1. I think Witchblade just went out of print, too. So awesome. I think I asked you about that last time, and you were going to go look into it. So that's that's yeah. great news. Uh, as far as what what else is in um, – in the you, you mentioned Weapon Zero. But what about one of my favorites? Hunter Killer. Any chance of that? Like I Hunter love Killer. Hunter Killer. Yeah, me too, man. Love Hunter Killer. Yeah. Hunter Killer is yeah. in print now. I mean, that's one where we still have the files. So you can actually go on Amazon or go to your comic shop and, and pick that up now. Uh, we might do a remastered. And we talked about doing something for its, its 15th or 20th. I can't remember which one of those is coming up. 15. Um, 15? Oh my yeah. gosh, no. Has it been 15 years? Yeah. No. Crazy. Well, huh? That was one of my favorite um, uh, team ups with a writer. You know, it was with Mark Wade. You know, Mark so Wade, it was yeah. one of those things where we would have lunch together, um, oh, and we would just like, 
you know, throw the ideas back and forth. And, you know, a few days later, I had the script in my hand of literally what we talked about at lunch. You know, and it was like, we just kind of meshed really well together. And mm-hmm. some of those stories are my favorite stories that we published in a long time. I thought they Can I really answer really News Pui Channel's question there? I think that's an important one to address. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Just so you understand, we use Kickstarter as a distribution option for fans that want to choose that. These books are available through every channel. And we've said that from the get-go. We didn't say they were only available on Kickstarter. The Kickstarter versions have a special dust cover. If you pledge to Kickstarter, you get all the other merchandise. It's part of a package. It's sort of it's sort of something designed for the hardcore long-term fan. Uh, if you just want to buy a soft cover or an omnibus to read it and have, all of these will be available and they all will be put back into print eventually. Um, you know, we, we have to do them one at a time, unfortunately. So it just takes a little bit of time. Please be patient. Yeah. And we also don't want to flood the market with stuff. Right. You know, it's like we're we put out what we can what we can put out um, with a, a certain level of quality, you know. Um, and we do appreciate the patience for people. But um, you know, for the Kickstarter stuff, um, you know, you, like Matt said, you get like cool stuff with it. You get you get mm-hmm. things that you don't get if you just buy the book. But the book is available, and I you know pick it up because it's it's I'm a little biased. But, you know, I think it's wildly entertaining. <laughs> you know? And I think the merch we do is pretty cool. And yeah. uh, shout out to Elena because she sort of takes point on that stuff. And we've gotten things like guitar picks and, and combs and, and mirrors and all kinds of interesting tchotchke kind of merch <laughs> that, that that's really fun to have. And, uh, you know, I've been trying to pick up guitar and playing it with my darkness pick. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Keep that to yourself. We don't, <laughs> I don't want to, no, don't bring that to the next Zoom meeting. You know, no, no, I'm not going to play it. I'm not, I, I, I can barely string out anything. I, I'm trying to see if I could play uh, Stairway to Heaven someday. Yeah, do that. Uh, it's but, the hunter killer hardcover that we need with everything, Matt. Love, I love that book. I love that book. Yeah, I love that book. And I, and I love Cyber Force. And, you know, we did a new version of it some uh, years back, um, also on Kickstarter, uh, but I also love. And, um, and, and again, you know, we do these shows and, you know, we get a lot of people that just, you know, hey, when's this book coming back? When's this book coming back? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can, you know, we've said this, uh, but in case people missed it, uh, Witchblade is coming back uh, in a new series, as well as The Darkness is coming back in a new series. So um, if anyone is like going, where are those books? Well, they're coming back. You know, those are characters that people constantly questioned us about and were constantly upset that we ever, you know, stopped publishing those books. You know what? We are too. You know, these are these are great books with great stories that, that we still have to tell. So um, keep an eye out for those. Sometime next year, those will be popping up. And Mark is writing the darkness. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, I'm writing the darkness. Yeah. Thing. So yeah, so, it'll be fun. Uh, okay, so people One are of asking favorite characters. Matt asking, uh, writing the darkness, yeah, but so, that's so me. Mark. Okay. Yeah, that's so me. Mark. Mark's writing the darkness. Yeah, I'm writing. Gotcha. I'm doing covers for it, and uh, I'm excited because I I love that character. He's one of my favorites. You know. Um, of all time, and regardless of whether you know we created it or not, you know, so I just love that character, you know. And mm-hmm. I thought those video games were amazing. Um, and you know, it's uh, we also get asked a lot. It's like, hey, when are you guys doing the Marvel MCU thing? And it's like, you know, you know, keep keep your eyes peeled. You know, we're always working on stuff, and you never know. You know, um, we don't announce things anymore until there's actually something going to happen. That's smart. Uh, yeah, Very because. Smart. Uh, look, development is is not that difficult, you know, in the grand scheme of things. You know, it's like, especially in today's Hollywood, you know, it doesn't really cost Hollywood anything to just say, hey, we want to develop this. You know, it's it's pennies, you know, to them to them these days. Um, so we don't we got to always have irons in the fire, always. You know, on various levels of like, ooh, this is exciting, or ooh, this is this is a possibility, but we're if stuff really starts cooking, we'll start making some announcements. But for the for the moment. It's like the exciting thing for us is that we are relaunching two of uh, our favorite franchises in Darkness and Witchblade. Can I answer a couple more of these questions I see? Go for it. <laughs> yes, um, I do. Oh. The collector, yes, more Aphrodite. Uh, Thomas Gant, uh, yes, Ballistic actually will be collected in one of the Cyberforce hardcovers. Awesome. Uh, Henry, yeah, Jordan, yeah. yes, Top Cow is still under the image banner. Adam okay. Messenger, yes, I would love to work with Colleen Duran again someday. Tom, yes, Think Tank someday. Uh, and then I don't know what these, these ones where they pay. Like I, I got you. More think tank, please. I'm working on think tank. I, I I have a new. 
I like the way I ended it. And this is sometimes difficult for people to understand. I get this question about sugar a lot too. It's like, when are we going to do more? It's like, well, I told the story I wanted to tell and I ended it the way I wanted to end it. So mm -hmm. uh, Think Tank I'm doing and it, David will be in it, but it's actually going to be about his daughter. Oh, okay. So, you know, we'll so see where it goes and then some of this other stuff. And are the, and Matthew asking, are the hardcovers Kickstarter only? No, they're not. They're available through uh, Amazon. They're available through the comic book stores. They have a different cover. So, um, I mean, the idea is the Kickstarter version has an exclusive cover that's only available to the people that want to do that and want to pledge it. If you just want to read it and do your thing, I mean, they're actually the same price roughly. If you buy it through the Kickstarter or you buy it through the comic book shop or Amazon, it's all roughly the same price. We sell them at the same wholesale to everyone. So, this is uh, this is the big difference. This is the Kickstarter dust jacket. It's exclusive to the Kickstarter, which is, pretty is cool. what uh, retailers will get. So it's art on board, and it's all in there. It's all in there. Yep, all those uh, issues are in 664 there. 664 pages is in the first. That's, one. that's huge. Oh, uh, Witchblade anime. We did we did a Witchblade anime. Somebody's asking a question if uh, we did. Yeah, some I forgot yeah. about that. That was yeah, a, a Witchblade anime, which did really really well. I've yeah. got. A, 2004 right. came out through fun and actually it's on uh i believe it's on crunchyroll right now uh you can actually go and watch the entire thing um it's uh funimation it was done by studio gonzo and they did a really good job yeah yeah they it's, killed it's it actually uh, very very cool very very a very nice interpretation of witchblade let's say different but you can tell that it's witchblade as you're watching it it's mark very, do you have an answer for jack's question here about gesture and composition Gesture and composition. You know, it's um, those are two very important things. Um, where's that question? It's so right thing. below us. It's right below on the on the video. Artist question: yeah. How important is gesture and composition in your line work? It's everything. You know, composition literally is king. You know, there's there's some very good you know, technical artists out there that completely shoot themselves in the foot because of composition. Right? It's like one of my earliest influences uh, were you know, some of my earliest influences were illustrators like uh, Frank Frazetta. Right. Uh, everybody loves Frank Rosetta. Right. And right. Um, and if you don't, I don't trust you. So um, <laughs> uh, but he was a master of composition. Right. And uh, telling a story in one single shot. So composition is everything. It doesn't matter how much stuff you have in that drawing, the panel, that page. That's not what's important. As long as you're conveying information that you want to convey, as long as the reader's eye goes directly to the money. Right. What's ever important, you know, because Matt will attest and people have seen this stuff online. Um, the Batman stuff is very detail oriented. There's a lot going on, a lot of uh, um, information for you to absorb for panel, but um, it's peripheral. Right. It's like your brain registers. That there's something going on. It's very gritty or tactile or whatever, but they see what's important for that panel. Right. And then their mind goes, oh, OK, that's cool over here. That's cool. But it doesn't matter. Right. And as you're reading the comic, you just keep going. If the composition is not solid, um, uh, subconsciously, people, even if they're not artists, they, they will know something's off, right? And so that's why cinematographers are so valuable in film and TV, right? It's not just the lighting, which is important, but it's the composition of their shots, right? It's That's critical. You know, the, the, the best painters out there. You know, when you look at a painting in the museum, it's like, oh, what's cool about that? It's like you, you're not even realizing it, but it's not just the technique. It's not the subject matter, but your brain is, it feels comfort in the composition of it. You know, you're not challenging people with weird tangents. Tangents are the worst thing in the world for an artist. Avoid tangents at all costs. You know, if you've got a hand going this way, don't have something that's going to make another shape, you know, in the background. Like you've got... Uh, an alligator, you know, or something is about to attack. Don't don't make those make a new shape. You know, don't make this create an oval. <laughs> you know, so be very careful about that. Learn composition. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge part of your craft. So that's the long-winded answer to your very short question. <laughs> that was a hell of an answer, man. Oh my god, <laughs> I don't even know what the hell I was just talking about. Forget. No, 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 no. You, you 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 were giving some great advice. Um, Composition's everything. Here's a question. Uh, thoughts on decompression as creators and readers. The what, Matt, you want, uh, what was that question? I don't, thought on on. I don't know what that means. Maybe what? they're asking about uh, decompressing from... Decompressing. You, you mean, mean after, after the after work? After finishing? 
That's what I was thinking. Oh, there is no after. <laughs> Matt, you play video games, right? Yeah, right. I do. I go kill yeah. stuff online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's very okay. helpful. Yeah, especially if if you're on deadline and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's a tough business that way. It's tough to walk away from it and not think about it anymore. Um, that, that's I don't really have an answer for that other than get a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you can, and just uh, be wary of burnout, you know, if you do let it just take over your entire life, um, which is very easy because it happens to a lot of people, uh, especially if you're in the freelance uh, end of this, because, uh, you know, hey, no work, no pay, right? And you got to pay those bills. So it can take over your life. But uh, I don't have an easy answer for it. Yeah. For that. That's an individual thing. I mean, one of the things that was great about having a studio environment, uh, because, you know, the creative arts are very... Um, lonely uh, whether you're a writer or a comic book artist or whatever you're usually working at home or yeah. if you have your own office somewhere you know but you're by yourself usually um, so it's very difficult you know when you're in a studio environment at least you have other people that you know do what you do and even though you're still talking comics you can decompress by hanging out with people that do what you do right and uh, you know, you can commiserate, you can complain about it, or you can like be enthusiastic about it and just support each other that way. Um, uh, I found the studio itself to be very cathartic and a good way to kind of just wash away, you know, your, the day's worth of commitments, right? I don't know if that was the question or if we answered it, but that's the best I could come up with, Matt, unless you got another one. I don't know. I mean, for me, it, it really is about... Uh... I think it's also if you do the job, you, you're happy with the work. I think that is a pivotal part of that. Like if you if you enjoy the work and you had a, you, you feel like you did a good job, because uh, I've done times sometimes where I struggle through something or I just it's not clicking with me. And uh, I have a there is when you get done with that or you turn it in, there's a point where you're kind of like, you know, you're just kind of a little like, I, I don't know, depression is the wrong word. But, uh, I, I think it's sometimes deadlines can suck, you know. Yeah. I think all the times deadlines can suck, <laughs> yeah. but and there is that yeah there is that moment of because the adrenaline leaves your 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 body, right? When you're trying to make that deadline, a lot of the times it's your brain is no longer thinking about anything else. It's like you're working on pure adrenaline or panic, you know, however you want to look at it. When that goes away, that uh, there is that weird relaxation that could almost be interpreted as being depressed, right? Because the high of it is gone. Um, and, you know, you could kind of look at, you know, like we talked about earlier, you know, feature films, they come out and you've got your weekend, right? Where it's, you know, somebody will work on a film for two years, right? And it's all about that opening weekend. You know, you're, you're, you're oh, waiting right. for it, right? You're leading up to it for two years or more. You, your, your anxiety is growing. Are people going to like it? Are people not going to like it? Is it going to bomb at the box office? Is my career going to be over? Comes, you know? Uh, come Saturday morning because studios know if the movie worked or not by Friday night, you know. Um, so, and then it's gone. Okay. Uh, now what? <laughs> I mean, it's it's literally that. It's gone after that, after a few weeks. And it's off to the next thing, right? But that high disappears after that opening weekend. You know, and we've had stuff with opening weekends that done really, really well. Even video games. Our Darkness games did great. Yeah. Right? And there's this, this massive high building up to the release of the game, right? Yeah. And everyone gets the game and you're getting these great reviews and both games got great reviews. And it's like, but it, suddenly you, you kind of go off that cliff and it's like, okay, everyone bought the game. Now they're going to go buy another one, you know? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh crap, now what am I going to do? Well, do the next thing. <laughs> you know? So yeah, you do kind of, you have to manage that up and down a little bit. Definitely uh, always keep moving forward. I think that's, that's great advice. Um, here's great a question, idea. Justin, to you, Matt. Uh, did you say, Did you mention anything about the postal deliverance? Uh, I haven't. Uh, we are working on a new postal arc. Uh, postal deliverance was actually written. I wrote postal with uh, the initial arc, and then I wrote that with Brian Hill. And Brian Hill actually wrote postal deliverance, and he's off uh, writing film and television, and I don't think he's going to be coming oh. back to comics. So, um I have some plans for Postal. Uh, right now, the first 25 issues, which is that one hardcover, was essentially the story I wanted to tell. Um, and again, I, I would love to do more at some point. Um, that's my favorite uh, show that gets it. 
that's of all my properties, the one that's been optioned the most in TV that never gets made. <laughs> I mean, that is one of those frustrating things every time, yeah, really. like four or five times, you know? Yeah, and it's awesome. You, you, there's, you have a couple of properties that uh, I think would be great for television, for streaming services. So it's, it's yeah. a, and, you know, again, you never know. Yeah, you know, we may have some announcements for those things. Awesome. What else we got here? Got All right, some more questions, or we'll, we'll take a we couple more questions and then yeah. uh, wrap up the evening because I, I don't yeah. want to take any more of your time. You, yeah. I know you're busy drawing Batman. I'm done uh, with that. Well, I'm, do, I'm, still, I'm still doing covers. Yeah, still doing okay. covers. So, uh, that's and that, there is yeah. a Top Cow exclusive cover, right? Isn't there? Yes. Exclusive? There are where, two. Where can two. people get those? Two of them from Top Cow. Yeah. Okay. Exclusively. Stay tuned on that. And they will be the yeah. best covers of the bunch. <laughs> yeah, if we'll, we'll, be, we'll be showing our work on that at some point soon. Excellent, so. excellent. I'll be happy to share that too. Yeah. Um, I'd appreciate any and all insight on Mister Sinister. Do you remember those days with Chris? I, I, I was. I mean, we're talking. To, my goodness, thirty years, thirty plus yeah. years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sinister, yeah, was, uh, and uh, I, I sign more of those books these days than anything. Yeah, oh. it's like, and because it, I'm slow, it, used, it would take me a while. You know, I would get these books suddenly. It's like, why the hell am I signing this comic? Then I would open it up and go, oh, it's, okay, first appearance of Jubilee. I get it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, why the hell am I signing this comic book? It's like, I don't even like the cover all that much. Oh, okay, first, is, first Mr. Sinister. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it's Wolverine. Okay, I get it, yeah, I'm, I'm a little slow. Um, you know, there was, um, you know, Chris uh, came up with Mr. Sinister, right? The, the concept of what he did and stuff like that. And he would kind of just leave me alone. To come up with what he looked like, right? We had a very good working relationship that way. He he wasn't really interested in telling me a character should look like this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he would give a description of what he was going to do, you know. And the name was kind of over the top, right, Mister Sinister. That's it's pretty much on the nose, but it it, it was kind of cool at the same time. And um, I, I knew, like, look, uh, at villains, especially back then, you know. Um, and I did know that, like. You know, Chris liked to see people in like black leather stuff, right? And we were doing the um, uh, Inferno. Was it? It was Inferno, right? Where, you did a uh, fall. Is that when Mister Sinister came in? Was it around the Inferno time? My memory. Yeah, it was. Uh, you did Mutant Massacre. You came in with Fall of Mutants, and then Inferno's where he's all got part of the same it. thing, right? And that's mm -hmm. where Mister Sinister. Yeah. So it's like, like you know, everything was a little bit um, sexed up a little. Um, and all, and all those books, you know, because uh, it was evil and that's, you know, sexible. So there you go. Um, but one of the things that um, people ask me, and I'll, I'll just come come out with it right now with the truth of, you know, his confetti cape okay. <laughs> you know, that became like a trademark for him. And uh, I'm a huge, huge Walt Silenson fan, right? Huge. Mm. Big influence on me. It's not as uh, apparent as some of my other ones. Because uh, only Walt can do Walt, and I tried to really ape him, and I just failed miserably. But I loved, like everyone else, I loved his Thor run. To me, that's the that's the definitive Thor was Walt Simonson, right? And I used to love the way he drew that cape. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. It went up off the shoulders. I went, oh, I can't just rip off Walt completely. But I always wanted to do that with a cape. So I just started sketching and play around. I kind of had the basic idea of what Sinister was looking like, and okay, you know the. Um, the horizontal lines that broke up the the suit and it was like these try these um, four pointed stars kind of uh, made sense to me visually. It kind of lined everything up, you know, including with this hairline and all that. I thought that was oh man, that's so clever, you know. Um, and then I was like, how am I gonna how am I gonna ape ape Walt without like ripping them off? Obviously, I was like, okay, I just started drawing a cape and then I started shredding it, right? And I just started making it tattered. I was like, well, that looks kind of sloppy. You know, he's like this guy who kind of preens around. He wouldn't do that. You know, he'd be like kind of this, you know, I'm, I'm looking badass and I'm fancy, you know, it's like I'm not wearing tattered clothes. So I just, I took the tatters and I just gave them clean edges and I mm -hmm. kept going with it. And just, I had, so I had the shape of the cape, but made out of streamers, right? Which nobody else yeah. really had. Yeah, maybe because it was goofy. I don't know, but it seemed to it, it caught on. People seemed to really like that, right? Because you could have fun with it. You know, movement. The movement was fun. You know, when, as an artist, right? You could you could draw these streamers coming off of this guy's cape, for lack of. I mean, it was a cape, for lack of a better term. But it was my it was my. I won't say rip off. I'll say homage 
Omar. To Walt. Oh, <laughs> I would say homage to Walt. To Walt. <laughs> nice. Uh, oh, this cool. this really quick is for Matt. Is the postal hardcover getting reprinted as well? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, it should. I actually hadn't thought about that because it was we were working on all the Cyberforce Switchblade. Do it. Do fitting it. them in at some point. I mean, it might be uh, two years away. Um, we're just trying to figure figure all that out. We can only do so many of these at the same time. But uh, I have a question for Mark based on what you just said about Mr. Sinister, actually. Um, what's cooler? Was it cooler to see Mr. Sinister like in one of the X-Men films or, or like Darkness being played in a video game? I'm just curious. As a creator, writer, or artist, you created both those oh, characters. Dark, darkness those being, yeah. Darkness. Darkness, darkness in a video game. You know, um, uh, and Matt, you know, you, know, you were there. You know, we, were, we were really proud of that. You know, oh, I don't yeah. think people understand how difficult, if not impossible, it is to get a video game made, right? Um, uh, people don't realize how expensive it is and how much at risk the company is. The, you know, the video, the the developers and the publishers, uh, how much they're putting on their gambling on right. whether or not a game is going to work. And the fact that we were able to get a you know and, and you know, Rich uh, Leibowitz really helped us out with that. And uh, the fact that we were able to get a game out from a company called Starbreeze, which they were just starting to blow up. And um, you know that first game is well, still to me one of the most beautiful games out there. Still holds up, you know. And, and you know, we, I think we were the first ones to have the actual writer of the comic write the game. Yeah, Paul Jenkins. Paul, wrote Paul Jenkins wrote that first game. Oh, yeah, he did. He wrote both of them actually, right? But um, so I mean, all that stuff we were really like to me, and you know, we've done a lot. It's like I was so proud of that. Yeah, right? and the translation was really cool to see that in gameplay. It was Jackie Estacado, right? And it was the darkness, and you know these were the darklings, and it's like it was just fun to look at and play, um, and knowing how difficult it is to do that and get that done, because um, you know, Mr. Sinister, Mr. Sinister is Marvel, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I was part of that creation process, sure, and I'm you know proud of all the stuff I did with Marvel, um, but that's their deal. Right, they can do whatever the hell they want with it, and it's like, of course they can make a game, of course they can make a movie, you know, of course they can make a TV show, yeah. you know, and you know, people forget that back in '99 or 2000, you know, um, we we did a TV show that was not Marvel, not DC, and it was a female lead in Witchblade, right, and we got it on the air, yeah, and the pilot was one of the highest rated, or uh, at the time, I think it was the highest rated pilot ever on cable television, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm, I'm, those are the things I'm most proud of, you know, because those are the things that, you know, you know we created, right? And uh, they came out pretty damn good. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'll always be proud of that stuff. The anime, too, is interesting because uh, people don't realize this because Marvel did some Japanese anime work after we did. But Witchblade was actually the first American camera book character that was translated into an authentic Japanese anime by a Japanese company. It had never been done before. Yeah. And uh, Marvel then did Wolverine. And, yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, we were first. And yeah. uh, so kudos to Studio Gonzo over in Japan for taking a yeah. chance and doing it. And it was it worked out really well. So yeah. we were pretty happy with that. I, I do remember one time, and I could be tripping here because uh, I am getting older, but I remember looking at a magazine and there was an article that, that Cyberforce was going to start being made into an animated series yeah. and they were going to work with a, a Japanese studio. And the, and the pictures that I saw, I was like, this is going to be the best thing ever. I can't wait until next year or whenever it was, you know. It was, it was actually, um, that was one of the times in my, in my career that I kind of went, wow, that was one that got away. You know, I, there's still days that I kind of get don't get over it, right? Because we literally we were going to be the replacement for the X Men cartoon, right? Mm -hmm. And I right. think also potentially uh, Young Blood was going to be going to yeah. be the Image Action Hour. White Hello, Hat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we actually had Graz Animation. They were the animation house who did the X Men. Oh, right? okay. And we actually we we had already uh, secured. In fact, they made toys mattel had the master license for yeah. cyber force and um then you know in the 11th hour you know we had all development and Mar uh, mattel was making all these toys and i saw you, know, you, you can even find them on you know if you go to ebay or whatever they, they, they put some out there but we would go to, to the marvel uh, mattel offices and like these amazing play sets and vehicles 
that they had spent money on developing on it. It's like, wow, this is going to be so cool. This is like mind blowing because they were going all in. Because Mattel had not been in the um, uh, action figure business yet, and they wanted to compete with uh, the ones that were. And so Top Cyberforce was going to be the vehicle to do that. Um, and then in the eleventh hour, you know, Saban Entertainment came in and bought Fox Kids. Yeah, which was the only place really right. to put your show on the air, right? And we had one of the last deals that was going to be like really beneficial, right? And then, then they they stopped it. In fact, I think laws changed where like someone like a toy manufacturer couldn't actually advertise on the show that they were part of or something. Um, after oh wow! So yeah, like, you're, yeah, you're right. They did that. Yeah, it was right at that time, right after you know. So it's like, oh my god, we were right there. And then when Saban came in and bought Fox Fox Kids, anything that was not Marvel was thrown out the window, right? And we were all the way down a path with that. And it's like that was an awkward moment when I had to tell Mattel that it wasn't going to happen. Oh man! Yeah. And I think it was at Toy Fair when I had to do that, and um, I felt really horrible because we, you know, we got some good relationships, and I really like those people. And Excuse me. They were really behind it, um, but yeah, yeah, that was a that was a tough one because we were literally going to be the replacement for the X Men because the X Men was done. Well, so, uh, as a kid, as a high schooler, I was really looking forward to that. That also I was too. And I always wondered if the pilot because you know you you used to go to conventions and you see bootleg copies of the Young Blood pilot or the Wildcats uh, show or or Savage Dragon. I was mm-hmm. like. Did I, did a pilot leak for Cyber Force at one time? Did they make it that far? Um, I'm going to wrap this up. But yeah. before I go, we have several questions about this. Right, we'll do rapid fire answers. All right. Well, this is Matthew, who is a phenomenal artist himself. Uh, he just recently made it as a full time artist. Cool. And Image Congrats. and Cyber Force were a huge right. inspiration for me as a kid and helped form my love of art. So he's saying a big thank you to you guys. Well, good luck and thank you. Uh, I can't wait to see it out there. Yeah, make it happen. It's all about it. So, it's up to Matthew, you, man. Look your Instagram, and I'll follow you, man. Yeah, yeah, Matthew Maggie. That's cool. who it is. Nice. Um, so, what what one piece of advice would you give somebody that's trying to make it into the comic fields? Like, if you could just either one of you two uh, from well, actually both of you uh, from a writer's perspective, from an artist's perspective, it's a one piece of advice you could give somebody. You go back in time and give yourself. Let's do man, that. Go for it. Um, I, I think the best advice I would give myself as a writer uh, is, is to worry less. And this is going to sound counterintuitive, but I used to stress out so much about plot. And uh, and, and a lot of my earlier writing work, I feel like uh, the characters kind of take a hit in exchange for building the world building, the, the laws of the universe, the world. Like I, I, Early on, I got so obsessed with the stories I was trying to tell that some of the characters that I go back and reread from my 90s work, I feel like they fell a little flat. So um, I would encourage people to always think character first uh, when you're writing. And, uh, you know, and, and one of the things I, I really, really suggest is read your dialogue out loud. You would be shocked at how when you read your dialogue out loud to yourself as, you, as you're going through an editing, because even when I edit, that's what I do. I read people's dialogue out loud because you'll hear things that sound wrong. And if it sounds wrong to you, your brain is telling you, you need to change it. And that's a lot of times. Uh, and that's something I actually learned from Alan Moore. Oh, um, okay. With art, um, practice, practice, practice. And it's a little easier for an artist to get noticed and to get hired than a writer. Because all you really need to do, it's a very, very simple process, is you put together a portfolio primarily of sequential work. Um, so that, you know, pinups are fine, but that's not what we want to see. Put together a portfolio, um, minimum five pages of sequential work, more if you can. Um, Bring your work to conventions, show it to as many professionals as you can that are willing to look at your work, Um, show them the stuff, keep your mouth shut, listen to the advice, do not counter, don't counter any of it, right? Do not, because they are, they are giving you, yeah, they are giving you their time. Just listen. Later on, you can say, well, that wasn't a real a-hole. I'm not going to do any of that. But at the table, just show your stuff, absorb everything they tell you. And if it clicks with you, go home and practice, make those corrections, go to the next convention, show your stuff again, and fine tune and hone your craft. Start showing it to editors, because editors go to these shows as well. Show it to other writers. They may want, they may have a project that they want an artist with, right? They go, wow, you've, you've got some skills, or your stuff will work with mine. Do that. 
right? And look, if you've got it, you'll get hired. It's really that simple. Uh, if you if you have what it takes, you will get hired as an artist because there is enough work out there for you, right? Then it's up to you to make a career out of it, right? Then it's on you, right? But that's that's a pretty direct. I, I mean, that's the best advice I could give. Uh, no, bo both of you killed it with that advice. I'm serious because well, it's just something that people have often asked me. Okay, this is the oh, thank you, Mr. DC Comics. This leads into the next question. What or the last question? What is where, where can people find you after Batman? And uh, Matt, what are you? What are your future projects? What are you guys going to be working on? Well, Mark, you want to start? All right, go ahead. Um, I, I actually am writing about twenty different things, and it's just uh, a, a bunch of different things, so it's hard to say. I just did Colossus, and I'm continuing to work on that. I'm working on a new project okay. called Zero G. Um, I'm trying to even think. I, I wrapped up a couple things. I'm working on uh, Thousand and One Arabian Nights uh, science fiction adaptation which should be kind of fun and uh, working on quite a few different things. So I'm excited about uh, a lot of that. There's a lot of stuff that we work out pretty far in advance on the writer side, uh, mm -hmm. but I am working on a new think tank. Uh, I, I'm thinking about a new postal. Um, you know, I've been working on uh, other stuff, but for the most part, you know, there's just, there's always something new and try to, to balance and work on different projects. And just real quick before I let Mark end this, uh, we are running the Top Cow Talent Hunt right now. You have three yes. more months to enter it. It's on topcow.com. For all you aspiring writers and artists, you can go there and uh, Teeny Howard, Isaac Goodhart, Stephanie Phillips, and uh, Ben Kahn. There's a cast of people that are uh, professionals in the industry now that were found through the Top Cow Talent Hunt over the last decade and the rules and the submission process. And it is Cyberforce this year. So you get to draw a Cyberforce story or write a Cyberforce story. It's for both writers and artists. So if you have any interest in that, uh, it ends November 15th. So you have three months to do it. And it's only uh, seven pages of art. So it should be yeah. easy to do in three months. You said it was in the Top Cow uh, website? Topcow.com slash talent hunt. I'll put the link in the description of this yeah. video. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I take all that stuff back. That's the best way to get in the comments. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I am, man. Because we actually do hire you. Yeah. The winner gets work. This isn't BS. They get published. Right? It's like you get published. You get out there. And then it's like, yeah, you know, we we're not we don't make you sign up, you know, 10 year contract. You know, it's no. like we want you to succeed. Yeah. You know, we're, this this is part of us uh just seeding the creative world. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, we want you know all the work you can do with us, but you know, it's all about giving people that in. So go ahead and check out that site, go check out that link. Uh, it's for writers and artists, yeah? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so uh, that's a good way to get noticed as a writer because it goes directly to that. Um, uh, to, Matt does a lot of that reading, if not all of it, yeah. for the writer. I, I will do all of it this year. Yeah, all right. Uh, so, yeah. yes, that is a, a wonderful way to get in there. Um, so check it out. Um, for me, you know, the Batman project was a massive thing. I hope people like it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with uh, what it is. It's a story that I wanted to tell. There was another question I saw there that it, was there a story that I always wanted to tell. This is kind of it. You know, oh, really? um, okay. I always wanted to tell this story um, of Batman and Joker teaming up and having to work on the same side and all the drama and comedy that that concept would bring. Right. Because it's, you know, Matt will, will attest to it. It's, it's funny and horrifying. It is. Yeah. Right. And, um, it's fun. It was fun to maintain that balance, right? And um, you know, obviously, uh, you're going to have a lot of drama. You're going to have a lot of um, interaction between you know Batman and Joker. And I think, I think the interaction is going to surprise a lot of people because it's not, I think, what a lot of people are going to expect. Mm -hmm. um, but you have these two like polar opposites that are uh, two sides of the same coin, right? You have this very interesting dynamic. You know, and how does that happen? You know, through a story, and I think I told that story pretty well through character. Um, so I really after, liked your voice. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no go ahead. You were about to. I really me. liked your voice for the Joker <laughs> because I've read a lot of Batman stories, and a lot of times the Joker is just not funny. I mean, they make him kind of horrifying, and and like he says, like dark shit. But mm -hmm. uh, Mark's Joker actually has some funny moments where I had to stop and I was like, holy man, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's actually quite funny. And uh, I was not expecting that. And then you'll flip the page and it's, it's horrifying. So it, it's yeah. not just, it's not uh, parody. It, it, it's, it's, he makes little quippy one-liners that, uh, that, that really made me laugh. 
I've been waiting for Mark to draw Batman since that freaking Batman black and white. Oh, cool. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. picture, and I'm like, yeah. come on. Oh, <laughs> so I'm so happy. And well, then, well here, it, here it is. So I, I hope you dig it. And then after that, it's all about, uh, you know, getting into the darkness because I just love that character so much. Really um, and, you know, Matt and I, we, we always talk about, you know, Matt listed, like, he's got so many things on his on his plate. But uh, we're going to talk more about stuff coming up, Matt and I, and I'm going to throw some more stuff on his plate because he's got <laughs> some ideas that he's kind of put on the shelf that I absolutely love that I want to get to. Um, and I have a drawer full of ideas that I want to get to. Um, I'm going to be concentrating more on the writing aspect of, uh, of things. Uh, I, I love to draw, so I'm never going to stop drawing. You know, but you'll be seeing more covers and concept work from me. Um, and uh, uh, but just you know, we both have just so many ideas. You know, that's that's what's going to be our future. You know, um, is just coming up with concepts and and putting out comics that we that we love and we hope that all of our supporters and and fans love too. Because like I said earlier. You know, we're all we're all a team, right? And it's like um, we appreciate that you guys support us, um, and you know, we want to give you the entertainment that uh, that keeps you entertained, you know, and just helps you escape the world, you know, and just kind of you can lose yourself in what we're the stories that we're telling. And again, we could not do this without you. So thank you all so much. And Omar, thank you for being one of those guys on, on the front lines that, that spreads the love of comics out there. Oh, it, it's my pleasure. I never thought I would be that guy and to get to talk to you guys and be a part of all this and push this book out to everyone watching my channel. Yes. It, it's my pleasure. Seriously. Awesome. The Dark um, Batman book will be out November 2nd, issue one. Um, and like you said, all the art for all seven issues is done. Uh, he's just wrapping up some of the scripts and the covers. And so it should be monthly. So between uh, November and May or June, whatever that seventh month is, uh, it should come out. Yeah. Oh, there's Lisa. These guys are on IG, are. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, along uh, at Top Cow. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a bot answer. Lisa with questions. Well played. Well played. Uh, again, thank you, Lisa, uh, for putting all this together. Yes. Thank you, Mark and Matt, for joining me. This has been a blast. Thank you all for watching.